my head like this and pretend like there's a room full of people. <laughs> and you can't go no further than that. Yeah, I had I would put chairs right here. Right here. <laughs> and so I knew that was my limit. And I was like, that's I knew, I knew that was harvest. I knew as far as I go. I, I would just start pacing. So that's I wore the paint off right That's now. why you're only going like this far? Yeah, because I would be wonder why you weren't done. He must have tamed him down. No. <laughs> <laughs> the camera tamed We like that. I didn't know it would be funny if I stood right here the whole time and caught the discipleship class. You never even seen me. <laughs> I just tried not to do that. So you watched it on video. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming back to discipleship class. We're still trying to social distance, doing all that stuff, trying to wash our hands. And the uh, Lord really convicted my heart. You know, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible, and it actually is talking about commending yourself or giving yourself to each other's conscience. And so what's he saying? He's saying, hey, listen, you know, at the time he's talking about eating meat. You know, and for Jewish people, that's a big deal for them to eat cow. They don't believe they should eat cow. They believe it's, a, it's an unclean animal. And so he's saying, you know, Paul's saying, he that believes in his heart and has grown up in the Lord may not have a problem with eating meat without a problem with eating cow. And so, but if eating cow in front of your other brother that's a new baby Christian in Christ makes your brother stumble, he's like, don't eat it. He says, don't eat it. Why? Because love's bigger than that. Love, love doesn't seek its own. Right. And so if he said, he actually goes on to say, if you have faith, have it to yourself. As we going to say, if you really have faith, why? Because that's what love does, because faith works through love. And so a lot of people I see are posting on social media and they're speaking out of a place of zeal and not from the source of love. Because you can speak from zeal, and they're speaking truth. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't have fear in this thing. We shouldn't be afraid of the coronavirus. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. He's not shocked. He's not falling off the throne. He's still Lord of our lives. He's able to heal our bodies. He commanded us to heal the sick. And so what they're saying is true, but the source of it's wrong. Right. Come on. Because they're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about somebody that may have a sick mom at home, that may have a sick grandma at home, that may have a sick sibling at home, that may have a a sick spouse at home that may have COPD or asthma, and so they don't have a face mask on everywhere they go. They're telling everybody that we shouldn't be wearing face masks now, but all of a sudden that person's feeling like, hey, you know, like what about me? What about my family? And so speaking the truth, the Bible says speaking the truth and love. Good morning. Thank you for coming. The Bible says speaking the truth and love is what grows all things up in Christ Jesus. Why? Because it's who he is. It's what we was created for. We was created for the image and the love of God. And so the Bible says, speaking the truth in love is what grows people up in all things. I've been seeing a lot of posts on Facebook. A lot of people have been, have been, been going against face masks because they're Christians, which thank you for wearing that. And God really just convicted my heart of it when I was in public. Like, if wearing a face mask keeps my brother from stumbling in Christ Jesus, I'm going to put a face mask on. Mm -hmm. Because good. love doesn't seek its own. And so when people begin to speak the truth and zeal and not love what they're saying is true, but the source is wrong, so it actually condemns instead of convicts. That's good. Wow. Because speaking the truth and love convicts. Why? Because conviction is shining means to shine light upon, means to bring out of darkness into the light. Jesus has transferred us out of darkness into the marvelous light. And why? Because when we've seen the truth of who he is, we've seen his holiness, we've seen his reality, we've seen who he was apart from him. When we see who we are apart from Christ Jesus, we see... Oh my gosh, I need him in my life. I, I'm, I'm sinful, I'm, I'm wicked, and I need, I need the love of Jesus in my life. That's why we come to Christ Jesus is because we see, I need him. And that's what speaking the truth in love does. We've seen, we seen, we love God because he first loved us. We love God because he first loved us. It says in 1 John, we love him because he first loved us. So us loving God... Is actually depend on us receiving love from God and then giving God the love that He gave to us. It's a it's a complete circuit. He pours love in, we pour the love in back to God, and then God pours it back into us, and it's a complete circuit. It's a love exchange. And so I asked myself, I've been asked myself this question. Actually, I was reading in a book and it says, it said when you come, it was talking about your motive for coming to Jesus and really seeking Jesus, spending time with the Lord, being with Him. And, and, it's, and it asked this question. I said, why do you do that? What's your, what's your motive to come be with Jesus? What's your motive? What, what, what drives you to go be with Jesus? What's your motive? And so I was reading my Bible, and I, if you have your Bible, slip open to Mark chapter 3. I've been reading through the book of Mark. I think I've got <coughs> They would fill void and never could feel anything else. You know? Yeah, that's good. The Bible says in Colossians, ye are complete in Christ Jesus. 
He found wholeness. Yeah. 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 You found meaning. Found meaning for your life. Yeah. You find purpose. Yeah. He's the truth of who we are. He's the, he's the reason why we are alive. We were made in his image. Uh, and that's the purpose. That's why Jesus came to restore that image. Mark chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 20. <clears throat> I've been teaching Briley. Where'd she go? She disappeared on me. She must be in the back. I've been teaching Briley. I say, you know, I'm like, Riley, come here. And when we read our word together, I say, read it slowly. When you read your word, read it slowly. That's what I was. We, I, we read this in a devotion. I've been applying it to my life, and it's really, really been good. Read it slowly. Read it gently. And then when you're reading something, as you're reading slowly, and you read something, and something really stands out to you, you pause for a second. You pray about it, you think about it, look at the context of it. Let God really, really begin to put it in your heart. And as you, then you just enjoy the presence of the Lord, you're praying about it, and you just keep on reading after that. And then the, that's when the Word of God will really just become settled in the heart. Settle that truth in your heart by doing it like that. And it's also, it'll make, it'll make like your devotion life, when you come to Jesus, your devotion life should never be strenuous. It shouldn't be something, it shouldn't be something that's heavy. Why? Because Jesus says, my burden is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And so if there's something in our relationship with God that's seeming heavy, that's not seeming light, then we're looking through the wrong eye. Because everything about him, we come to find peace. We come to find wholeness. We come to find soundness. We come to find wellness. And so if there's something we're looking at in our devotion life that seems strenuous, that seems like we have to work or try to do to be something in our devotion life isn't adding up with what he has for us. Because everything about him, when we come and, and enjoy the Lord in our prayer time, everything in our prayer time do the same thing in your prayer time. You just, you, you, what I would call, just behold him, just be with him, abide in him, and you just sit with him. And then actually, what I've been learning is you're going to spend less time even talking. See, when you have a prayer time that's full of talking, you have a prayer time that's strenuous. When you have a prayer time that's just full of one-way communication, you have a, it's going to wear you out. Your devotion time is going to be, your devotion time should be so pleasant, so joyful, so peaceful. It should be so gentle. The presence of God, Jesus is gentle. It says a bruised reed, he will not break, and a smoking flax, he will not quench. What's he's talking about? When we come to Jesus and we're just this brittle reed, he's not going to break you in half. He's going to make you whole. And so everything in our devotion life, when we come to Jesus, should just be, it's, it's all about your heart, and you and you're just connect with God in your heart. You guys with me? Okay. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life that's in your word. Jesus, we just don't want to know about you. We want to know you. We want to know your heart. Father God, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that this word would go in. Father, we trust the seed. We trust the seed that's being placed in our heart to grow up, bring forth fruit in our lives through your word, Jesus. Jesus, we trust your word as we sow it in our hearts, as we sow your word in our mind, that it's transforming our minds. It's transforming, it's changing our hearts, it's changing the reason why we are alive. We trust your word, Jesus. We trust your word, Jesus. I just thank you that you hold your word, you honor your word above your own name. I thank you that you look, Jesus, God, you watch over your word to fulfill it. God, and I'm just asking you right now, would you fulfill your word in our heart? God, I just pray that words that we've sown in our heart, words that we've received in our heart, Father God, in the past would just begin to bud and spring forth right now in this season, Father God. I just thank you for the peace that your word brings. We honor your word, Jesus. We honor your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> verse 20, Mark chapter 3, verse 20 says, One time, Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon, he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. Pause right there on verse 20. Go into 21. It says, soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat because they were so busy with people coming in and out of the house. They were so busy people coming in the house. But what's amazing to me is Jesus found himself in a house, not on a stage, not on a platform. He wasn't looking for people. It says that, that uh, he will not raise his voice in the streets. It says he didn't even hear his voice in the streets. People heard and seen who he was, so they flocked to him. And that's, that's when we come to Jesus, we have to come to him to 
to know Him. Our heart should always be to know Him, to please Him, and to follow and do what He says. That's when we come to Jesus. It's to, it's to know Him, to please Him, and do what He says. To obey His commandments. When we come to Jesus, we want to hear from Him, read from Him. This is what people are doing. They're coming to Jesus to be healed from diseases, from sickness. This is why we come to Jesus. To be healed, to be whole, to be sound. To see Him, to be with Him, to have Him mold Himself, shape us up. You know, Paul says that we grow up into the fullness of the stature of Christ, to a perfect man. Right? So that's why we're coming to Jesus, is so that He can grow us up. Listen to this. I read this this morning. I wept and wept and wept and wept. And it says, Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. And verse 20. Because in John chapter 4, it says that there was a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman, Jesus had an aide. It said he sat by a well. It says he was weary from his journey. Because Jesus is a man like us. So Jesus is weary from his journey. So he's wore out from his journey. And so he sits by a well. It says his disciples go into town to buy food. This is John chapter 4. And they come to Jesus and they're like, none of them even ask. He says, none of them even ask why are you talking to the spiritual woman. Why? Because they trust Jesus. And when you really come to Jesus and you know him, you'll always trust what he's doing in your life. And so when, he comes, when they come back to Jesus, he says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. He says, the thing, and what he's really saying, he's saying, the thing that drives me is to do the will of my Father. The thing that really nourishes me, the thing where I find my purpose is to do the will of my Father, is to do what God wants to do, is to do what Jesus wants to do. And we come to God so we can learn what he wants us to do. And the main, the main purpose, the main motive of our life should be to do what he tells us to do. Love is fulfilled in this, if you obey his commandments. That's, you want to know Jesus' love language? It's obeying his commandments. And so he's saying, the, uh, the food that I have to eat, which you do not know of, the nourishment, what it says in the New Living Translation, is what I'm reading right here today. He says, the nourishment that I have, the food I have to eat of, the nourishment that I'm getting is to do the will of my Father who sent me. And what's he saying? He's saying, the Father sent me here to encounter this Samaritan woman, to encounter this town, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing right here. I don't have time to eat because I, I want to do what God has to do for me. That's what, that's what he was saying. And so when he's saying that the disciples didn't even have time to eat, it's saying that they so exalted. This is where unity comes in. This is where dying to yourself comes in. This is where love does not seek its own comes in. Because when you begin to so exalt who God is in your life, you'll begin to lift other people's needs up above yours. You'll begin to so prefer, like the Bible says, one another above yourself. You'll begin to think and honor one another above yourself. They didn't even have time to eat. They were so ready to put off their old man. They were so ready to put off their nature. They were so ready to put off what they thought was normal and to do what God wants them to do. That's why we come to Jesus. Is to be in that place to do what God would have us to do. You guys with me? Verse 21. Just because there's a camera, man, I need you guys. I need some feedback. Yeah. I've just, 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 it's just been me and this camera for like eight weeks. Does that make sense? So it's all about, because I, what, I, what, I, what it's really all about, it's really all about just knowing him. Like unless Jesus really comes into our life and changes us, like, all this is really kind of just in vain. Well, you hear people talk about that, you know, well, I don't believe, but I, I think he was a, a good prophet and that he established all of these things. And, you know, the things that he done, if you live your life by them, you will have a better life. Mm -hmm. But just to live your life by them and not know him, then you're, you don't get completed. You don't get, you know, meaning for your life. That's you know? so good. You know, I mean, it's just. Yeah, that's so good. So you're kind of like just saying, like, if I, you know, so if I read my word and I pray so much and I fast so much and I worship so much, I'm expecting this result. Right. Like, I want this blessing in my life. Right. And so, and then what happens with a lot of people is when they do that and then they don't because they're still living externally. They're still living on a horizontal line instead of fixing their eyes onto heaven, instead of fixing their eyes on things that are unseen. They're fixing their eyes on things that are seen. And that's such a good point. When you have a, when you have a devotion life. See, so many times you have to learn to receive in your heart that everything that happens to you in your devotion life, whether you sit with God and your mind was wandering and you have to constantly reel your mind in, or you're sitting with God and, and, and His presence comes, you begin to weep and He gives you revelation out of His Word, you have to receive both of those as if they was from the Lord. Because if you don't, you'll think, well, God, what would you do? I held up my end of the deal, where was yours? Because it's really, it's just about loving him. It's just about knowing him. It's about listening, obeying what he's telling you to do. And if we still live on the horizontal line of, well, I did this, God, it's kind of like giving. 
with expecting. Yeah, we're making it for us. Yeah, we're doing it. Isn't it's not about us? See, that's where that's where it says his disciples didn't even find time to eat because it wasn't about them. It was about the people trying to come into the house. And so, as we're the the solid body of River Faith Church or of your of your local church, as people come into your house, you begin to automatically prefer them above yourself, and you're ready to serve them. That's what's happening here. Because for us, role model was I came to serve. Yeah, I didn't come to be served. But I came to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. That's it. This stuff's so good. What version are you reading from? This is the New Living Translation. My wife actually got me this for a, a gift. Um, and so I just, I just been, I read it out of it this morning and I really liked no, it. And so I've read it out of the New King, James, New King James Version for about six years. I've never even read another translation, like study. And so I grabbed this one and flipped it open and I'm just going for it. I like to, in verse 20, this Bible says one time. It says one time. I love how personal Jesus is. You can go a few verses back and it says that Jesus named James and James and John. Does anybody know the nicknames Jesus gave James and John? He named them the Sons of Thunder. Yeah. Bonerges. He named them the Sons of Thunder. And so I just love how personal Jesus is. Like I bet that has some deep spiritual meaning, but I don't know it. But I, what I do know is how personal Jesus is. And that he meets us right where we're at. And that he was just like... It was almost just like they were close friends, like almost like, you know, like Pastor, the, Pastor Donnie had a nickname for me, you know. <laughs> Knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> That's how personal Jesus is. He's, he's meeting people right where they're at. That's what he's doing. That's what love does. It, it so prefers everyone else above themselves. They're ready to meet people right where they're at. They're willing to lay down their life to meet people where they're at. It's becoming love. That's the truth of why Jesus came is to is to have his Holy Spirit in us and become love. It's the highest form of worship, surrendering to God. We can go through lifting your hands and laying prostrate on the floor and clapping and, and getting on your knees and doing all this stuff for the Lord. But the highest form of worship is surrendering to Jesus and obeying when he would his commandments. That's the highest form of worship. And becoming love. Verse 21. When his family heard what was happening. They tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. I'm going to read that again. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. And so you have to think about what... Because no prophet is accepted... Every prophet is accepted unless they're in their own town. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because they, they know Jesus. They know his family. Is this not the son of the carpenter? And so... You know, they see Jesus, and he's got this. It says right before that, right, going into the context that there's people from Jerusalem. There's people from all over the area following Jesus from the north, east, south, west. Jesus has this large crowd following him. Now he calls 12 disciples out of the crowds to pour into and place himself into. And his family, seeing these things that Jesus is doing, they're like, what is, what's, what's Jesus doing? <laughs> what's Jesus doing? But he's doing what we just read in verse 21, or in verse 20, he's... He's so preferring other people. He's so fulfilling the will of God. He's so doing what God called him to do. And he's teaching other people how to do it too in the 12. That's why Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. I came to bring a sword. And he goes on, a man will be divided against his son. A father will be divided against his son. A mother against her daughter. A mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. You know, he goes on to say that. Why? Because he's saying, he's saying, I'm so going to bring division. He's talking about it's twofold. He's talking about a Jewish man believing in Jesus Christ. I went, I went to Israel. I was so blessed to get to go. And did you know less than 1% of the Jews in Israel believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior? I was sent by a Jewish man on the airplane, and I began, I said, Jesus saved me. He looked at me and said, save you from what? <laughs> wow. I said, from me. Because he just said, he's like, he's like, no, he said, Jesus was just, this is what they say about Jesus. They'll tell you this. You tell you, you say, I'm a Christian who believes in Jesus. They'll say, no. Jesus was just a prophet that was kind of high on himself. He's still dead. That's what they say about Jesus. And in fact, the Bible says, and he even told me this on the airplane, and he wasn't like some studying, he didn't have the hat on. He was like, I mean, he got here, I mean, I don't, being judgmental, but like, he wasn't like this like, Jewish scholar by any means. He just said, no, they just paid the guards to tell everybody that, you know, that, or they just, you know. You know what the Bible says? And it says that they paid off the guards to keep it silent and to just tell people, no, that didn't happen. That's still what the Bible says is still reportedly common today. That's still what they say today. That's what they'll tell you. No, they just, mm -mm, that didn't happen. Wow. 
It's crazy. And so when Jesus comes to bring a sword, he's saying, there's going to be a, a son's going to come into his house and say, Mom and Dad, I believe Jesus Christ is Savior, and I believe the only way to heaven is in his name. And I believe I'm justified by faith in Christ Jesus. And his parents are going to say, no, you're not. Get out of my house. I mean, that's the sword that Jesus was coming to bring. He's saying that a son's going to come to his father and mother and be like, Mom and Dad, I, I got saved today. I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus. And I believe that he's the king of Israel. I believe that he's the Messiah. I believe that he's, he's going to reign and sit on the throne of David forever. And they'd say, uh-uh, get out of here. And then now it's also twofold in our life because now he's going to begin to separate us. He came to bring a sword. He's going to begin to separate us from things of this world. That's what the word of God does. It separates us, cleanses us, sanctifies us. We're sanctified, but we're being sanctified. We're saved, but one day we will be saved. Good. You get it? He's out of his mind, they said. Verse 22, but the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. In Latin, it actually says Beelzebub. He's the prince of Beelzebub. In Greek, they call him Beelzebul. But the New King James says Beelzebub. He casts out demons by demons. That's where he gets his power from. Verse 22, that's what he says. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Verse 23, I want to, I want to begin to really pull from this and see how we can glean from this chapter. Verse 23 it says, Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan? He asked. Verse 24, a kingdom divided by civil war, he says, will collapse. A house divided will not stand. Verse 25, simil similarly, I struggle with that word. So, somebody help me. Similarly? Similarity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. What just happened to Jesus three or four verses up? They're saying, Jesus... You're crazy. He's saying, just listen. <laughs> and if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let's pause right there. Go into verse 27. Look your finger there. You know what he's doing? He's actually revealing a tactic of the enemy. Come on. He's actually revealing what the strategy of the enemy is. He's saying even the devil knows if he can cause division, he's bringing you down. He knows if he can cause division in our churches. He knows if he can cause division in your mind. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's why, listen, there's been people that everybody is a part of the body. And the pastor of the church is the eye because they cast the vision of the church. They're the priestly role in the body of Christ. And that's why the body, that's why Jesus says, if the eye is good, the whole body will be flooded full of light. Why? Because everybody in the body is going to give heed to the vision that was given by the pastor, therefore causing light in the whole body of Christ. Good. That also means another thing, you know, if your eye is fixed wholly on Jesus, the finished work, who he is in you, around you, and in the people around you, you can actually love them for who they were really created to be. And then your eye is good that way. But really, your eye is good when you fall in line with the vision of what your church is doing, with what the community church is doing, what God's doing in your church, and you're not coming against that because that would be darkness. Because he knows if he can cause division, he brings destruction. Let's not wrote this down. If you can't agree with the vision, you cause division. If you can't agree with the vision, you cause division. Yes. If you can't agree with the vision of your church, where your church is going, where your pastor is going, where your leadership is going, with what your Jesus is going, you immediately cause division. You're not causing, you're not allowing light to flood the whole body. Because the body grows by what every joint and ligament supplies. And if somebody don't agree with the body, if somebody don't agree with the vision, they automatically cut off the supply that they was adding to the body to grow it up to look like him. Because we're all being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. And so as soon as he can stop us from being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit, he's going to keep the church from manifesting who he is in the world because that's the purpose of the church. passionate about this thing.
What just happened to Jesus? What literally, why is in the context of this scripture, what just happened to Jesus? His whole family's going, Jesus, you crazy. <laughs> and Jesus saying, listen, I already know and I see and exposed because of the same spirit that was working in his family begins to work in the Pharisee leaders. And they're saying, no, you're crazy, man. You're demon possessed. And you're trying to do what? Cause division. And so the love of God has to be so placed in our heart. The love of God, we have to be so focused on the love of God in your heart. Your mind is so limited. Your heart can take you places your mind will never fit. Like your heart just has to be so surrendered to the Lord, so fathered by the Lord, so filled with truth. That when even something in your family so personal, so sensual, so just, just right, so intimate. And comes against you, that it doesn't move you because you're founded on the rock. You're founded on the rock. Jesus says, if you hear these sayings of mine, going back to verse 21, and, do, and you do these sayings, then I'm telling you right here in chapters 5 and 6 and 7, this Matthew chapters 5, 6 and 7, if you do what I'm telling you right here, I'll show you who this man's like. He's like a man that dug deep, worked his back off, dug way deep, and he laid a foundation, and he built the house, and the winds came and beat on that house, and the rain beat on that house, and, and, and the flood beat on the house, but it stood. Because he had so in his heart dug a foundation, dug deep. It takes, it takes time and effort to dig a well. Okay? And so he's saying, this man has dug deep and he, and he listens to what I say no matter what. But the rain didn't beat on the man. The rain beat on the house. Because the enemy will come and beat on what you believe. The enemy will come and believe on your, and beat on your relationships. The enemy will come and beat on, on the people around you, on things you've, on what you believe about God, on, the, on his word. The enemy came right from the beginning in Genesis and tried to beat on the word that God had given Adam and Eve. The enemy comes today and tried, and he talks about it. And God's so amazing because then he talks about it in Mark chapter 4. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is as if a sower went out to sow. And then he, later he says the word that he, the, the seed that he sowed was the word of God. And the enemy comes for the word. Because he, knows, because he knows in John chapter 8, it says, If we know the truth and we abide in his truth, we'll be disciples indeed. We'll know the truth, and the truth will what? Disagree. And so what's he come for? He comes to test the integrity of the word. He comes to test the integrity of the word. And as soon as we don't believe the integrity of the word, we don't believe the integrity of the vision, and it automatically causes division. I'm sweating. Workshops. <laughs> Workshops, man. <laughs> Workshops. Are you guys with me? Yeah. I'm going to say it one more time. If you can't agree with the vision, you can cause division. Yes. If you don't like where your flight's going, get off the airplane. Right, that's right. I mean... I stopped in verse 27. He says, let me illustrate this further. He's saying, who is powerful enough? Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up, take him captive, tie him up, and then plunder his house. Listen, pause right there. What's he talking about? He's talking about who is strong enough to bind the enemy and take back from the enemy what he's taken from you. He's saying, who's strong enough? He's saying, I am. I'm the one that has taken the enemy captive. Because when he died, it says he ascended on high. What does this mean? But that he first descended to the lower parts of the earth. And when he ascended, he led captivity captive. What it says in Ephesians. He led captivity captive. He's saying, I've taken captive the things that's keeping you captive, and I've taken back the things the enemy stole from you. But only he's strong enough to do that. Come on, let's go. He's saying, I don't cast out Satan. I tie him up and take his stuff. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I destroy him. I stepped on him. I crushed his head with my heel, and now I'm taking back what he's taken from you, and I'm giving it back to you. All authority on heaven has been given to me on heaven and earth. He says, give it. Why? Because the Father gave it to him. He was given the name above every name. Do you realize your Bible says that in Philippians chapter 2? It says that in Matthew. It says he was 
given all authority in heaven and earth. What's it mean? It means that he ascended as a man, flesh and bone, forever. Sits on the seat of heaven, making intercession for man. Forever he lives to make intercession, to be the mediator of God and man forever. It says, oh my gosh, it's crazy. And because he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of the cross. Because he did that as a man. Because he did that as a man. He was given the name above every name. So it says in Philippians chapter 2. That's, the, that's where unity comes from. Is through that same humility. Of being able to exalt power. Being able to be right. I'm going to use Michael for example. Because I know he's trying to take it. If Michael was wrong. And I had the ability to exert authority and be right over him. And batter him down. But instead I showed forgiveness. Loved him like a brother. And exhorted him as a brother. That's what humility is. It's controlled strength. The meek will inherit the earth. Do you get it? Yeah. And then he was given that authority. And he says, go therefore and make disciples. Why? Because he says, everything that I have, I'm giving to you. But it's only him. Only him. Not in us, not in our devotion, not in our strength. It's only by coming to him, putting off ourselves. And being obedient, listening to Jesus, and obeying his word is ever that the enemy taken captive in our life. Does that make any sense? Sometimes I'm like, I'm just telling a big parable. <laughs> Maybe somebody will get something. <laughs> That's good. I love you guys. Because it's speaking the truth in love that grows up onto all things. And to the head, which is Christ Jesus. Into the head, into a way of thinking. Because the body just does what the mind tells it to do. And so if you can grow up into the head, which is Christ Jesus, the body will just do what the head's telling it to do. Yes. Yeah. Verse 28, he says, I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. Verse 29, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He's, this, the New the Living Translation says, this is a sin with eternal consequence. And now how many of you, I'm going to raise my hand because I was one of them. Before I really got saved, I would blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I would. But the thing is, it says that nobody can say that Jesus this is what it says in 1 Corinthians. Nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. And so, and it says that nobody can curse the Spirit of God if they have the Spirit of God. And what are we saved by? What's the seal of our redemption? When Jesus comes by, it says, what's the deal? What's the signet stamp? That's what that word means in Ephesians. What's the signet stamp by the ring of a king stapling it down on an envelope saying, this is my approved message. This is my approved messenger. Is the Holy Spirit in our life. And it's by that Holy Spirit that God's going to take us to heaven. So somebody that blasphemes the Holy Spirit can never confess Jesus as Lord and therefore never be saved. You see that? And so in that, you have to find forgiveness. I've talked to so many people that will bring that scripture up. Because the enemy will just take that and be like, you'll never be forgiven. You might as well not even try. That's what I have. I've talked to, I've talked to probably five or six different people that has had, we've had this conversation before. You guys with me? He told them this because they were saying... He's possessed by an evil spirit. You know what also he's doing there? What's not really like the Lord really showed me this. He's also showing us how valuable the Holy Spirit is. He says, every blasphemy that's spoken against the Son of Man, he says, it's forgiven. Every blasphemy that's spoken except by the Holy Spirit, you know what he's doing? He's exalting the value of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, that's how... That's how Valuable, the Holy Spirit is. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the gift that was given to us. It's the gift that was given when Christ died. And all of a sudden, we receive Christ Jesus, and He who is Christ is one Spirit with Him. Because we're made up of three parts: Spirit, Soul, and Body. And so, all of a sudden, it's not our it's not our flesh that's receiving Christ Jesus, but it's our Spirit. 
Because also now our spirit's clean, our spirit's whole, our spirit has become the holiest of holy. And Jesus walks into us and he walks into the room and he goes, I'm going to move in. Hold on, bring it. This is a suitcase. <laughs> he says, I'm going to live here. <laughs> because he who is the Lord is one spirit with him. But now you've been born again. So now no longer is your spirit ruled by your flesh. But now, you're, now your flesh is being ruled by your spirit. That's why there's this the second. That's why God hated Esau but loved Jacob. That's why Joshua walked into the promised land and not Moses. That's why Jesus came after John the Baptist. Because there's the theme of second, because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God knew it was his nature to do it that way, to be born again in John chapter 3. Yeah? And now suddenly when you're born again, your flesh becomes a subjection to your spirit. No longer is your spirit in subjection to your flesh. Good. Isn't that cool? How are we doing? Oh, okay. 1018. Thank you, Jesus. He goes on to Mark chapter 4. I'm going to just leave us with this. And we're going to pray together. We'll go on to church and leave us this. Mark chapter 4. Listen, we have to so learn in our devotional life. I kind of started with that, and I want to end on that. Because that's the main thing that's important to me, is that you have a solid devotion life with Christ Jesus. Apart from church, there's a place in your heart, a place in your mind that you're with him throughout the week. That's the main thing that burns in my heart, is that people would, would really fall in love with God. And so, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus talks, the whole thing is about seed. About what? And about seed, about sowing seed. Remember what I said, the word of God is seed. He said, he who sows went out to sow. So it's seed. The seed is the word. It says the enemy comes for the word. And then he talks about different characteristics of the heart, different circumstances that chokes the ground. He talks about all that stuff. But the main thing is, is that Jesus trusts the seed. How do I know that? Because it says Jesus knew that if a faithful grain of wheat fell to the ground and died, it may die alone. But if it died, it would bear much fruit. That's what he says about himself. And so he's saying... I know and I believe. So you have to believe this in your heart to give yourself faith when you read your word. That every time you read this word, you're putting seed into your heart, into your mind, and you're believing that it's going to bear fruit in your life. It's going to bear much fruit in your life. And you have to believe that the word of God is seed that you're sowing in your heart. Because Jesus trusts the seed. Jesus trusts the word. He is the word. It's inseparable. And so as you sow the seed, you just have faith. I want to leave you with that. Have faith. In the seed that you're sowing in your heart. Because I'm telling you, don't grow weary in your well-doing. Because in due time, you're going to reap a harvest. And so keep sowing that seed in your heart through this next week. Because Jesus trusts that seed. And I trust it. And you need to trust it. That it's going to bear fruit in your life. And the lives. And all of a sudden, what's people going to do? It's like a mustard tree that grows up. And it says the birds of the air come. And they nest in it and find shade in it. What's he saying? He's saying people are going to come to you. Glean from what you've grown up to be. Find comfort from their affliction because of the word that's been sown in you. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Isn't he cool? I love him. He's my whole boy. Okay, let's pray. Dad, would you dismiss us in prayer? Oh, precious Heavenly Father. Father, Father, Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for we can have these classes, Lord God. Lord, we thank you that we can have a, a, a building to come to that just to gather together as your church, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for just your presence that you do pour out upon us, Father. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you would guide us, Father, Lord God. Lord, we pray that we will receive wisdom from this word that's spoken today, Lord God. Lord, that it will be a seed that will grow, Father, in us, Lord God. And Lord, that we will just walk in.